With no further ado, just to stick to the hour mark, and as we're also live on LinkedIn now for the first time, a big warm welcome and accord to another of our High Rise Academy Masterclass. Um, to everyone that's new to the format, and also for you, Nakor, it's a format that we run uh, monthly with recognized mm -hmm. experts in any given field within, or like today, a little bit outside of sales, maybe. Um, but that we're inviting because we think they have reached mastery or top-notch knowledge that we really want our community to participate in and, and, and to be able to tap into. Today, we are really, really uh, happy to have you as a co-host. Uh, I introduce you shortly on the still underserved and highly um, yeah, um, underappreciated topic of mastering not only your inner health, but your inner game of emotional intelligence and well-being. So a big, warm welcome, Nako, and thanks for being here tonight. Thank you, Dom. Thank you so much. And before um, I give it over to you, uh, just a quick introduction on you, and please feel free to jump in afterwards if, if uh, that did you right. Um, you originally started out as a, a tennis professional from what I saw on LinkedIn, which I'm highly passionate about it. I told you too, which caught my attention. And there are, I think, big parallels from tennis to, um, to what you're talking about today. Uh, you worked in HR and learning and development. Uh, companies like Nike, Free Now, uh, you're an emotional intelligence coach, a mindfulness teacher. And I think that you talk to the topic of emotional intelligence and mindfulness to a broad audience. So I think companies like PwC or Zalando to ballet theaters or tennis players book you. And today it's Harvest Academy. So uh, with that, very much looking forward and over to you. Thanks so much, Tom. Okay. Super excited and and yeah, very excited to to welcome every one of you. Let me just share a quick presentation on my screen. Okay. Can you see that? Perfectly. Just yes. Sure. Okay. So yeah, welcome to this master class on mastering the inner game of of emotional intelligence, which I think, like Dominic was saying now, it can be quite relatable to sales because I think you're not only interacting with yourself, you're interacting with, with other people in a, on a daily basis. So I think it will be super useful. And just to lay out the context, my goal here is to familiarize you with the stress, which I think is a word that is used by by everyone. Like, oh, I'm stressed, but what does it really mean? So to really bring it to, to the ground and also to familiarize yourself with automatic responses that come with stress. When, when you're stressed, what do you resort to? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? And I mean, I want introspect into this because I think it's very, very interesting um for also for the game of sales because it's a lot about interaction and then we'll go at the end into the practice and of course if there's any questions um any comments feel free to share them on the chat great okay so just to share um yeah hello from from my side like um dominic was saying um my name is nakor and Emotional intelligence is, is, is a big passion of mine. It's also my work since a, a few years. Like I believe emotional intelligence is a language as if you're learning a foreign language, uh, you can also get to learn emotional intelligence. This means that it's something, is a skill that is trainable. It's, I think we know it's already a myth, you know, maybe when you were a kid and you know, they told you and you know, this is, what you're what you're given this is what you're gonna get your whole life and we know with emotional intelligence it's not like that it's something trainable uh skills like self-management self-awareness motivation empathy leadership are all trainable so i think those are all great news and i'm very excited to to bring those to to life and like um like don was saying a huge part of of my life has been into tennis playing tennis professionally 
and now helping tennis players from the other side into emotional side, mental side of it, because it's uh, it's a huge component. It's not only how good you are hitting a, a tennis ball. And just with that, I like to start sessions with agreements, right? Just to set a sort of foundation, meaning that as much as possible, um, I don't want to give a lecture like as if I was here a, a teacher, but I think when it comes to emotional intelligence, there needs to be a cooperation, meaning that I bring here 50% with theory, with a framework, with practice, et cetera. And I think it's as important from participants, whether you're watching live, whether you're watching the recording, to also put in the work and bring it to yourself. Okay, so there's something very important. Also knowing that anything that you're sharing here there's an element of confidentiality. There's nothing, um, the names are not important. Always always advise to take the, the learnings out of the experience and not who said what is, 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 is very relevant. And also I know it's at least for me, it's 6 p.m. in, in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So taking care of yourself. So if you need some water, some tea, uh, please do that. I don't know that for, for yourself. So, so taking care. And also avoiding distractions. If you can have the phone off, I think you will get more of it. And if there's something happening, to do have patience. But we've been working with these tools for some years already. And like use video if you're comfortable. And this is completely optional. Okay. So the first thing I say is that when it comes to emotional intelligence, the first thing that is essential is to have an emotional vocabulary. When we're on the streets, when we're talking to colleagues, when we're talking to too many people, we say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm good, I'm bad, I'm okay. Um, but we don't really know what that means. What is good for me or good for Dominic or for someone else is completely unique. So it's very hard to, to be a magician and to guess for, for billions of people. So what I like to bring is an emotion, a list of emotions, which as you can see here on the screen, there are pleasant ones, there are unpleasant ones. I don't call them good emotions or bad emotions. Some of them are pleasant, some of them are unpleasant and all of them bring an intelligence. So for the sake of now, um, there's an invitation to share on the chat one or two emotions that are present with you at the moment. That can be pleasant or that can be unpleasant. And to all of you, I have forgotten to tell you, very important, um, the chat is not going to work, but the Q&A function, okay? So I think at the center, at the bottom center, slightly to your right should be a Q&A window. Uh, a button, click on that uh, and just put it in there. Now, starting with what are your emotions? Uh, I will also put it in and uh, please do not feel any need to be shy. I'll put mine in the chat for all of you because I can't uh, put it in the Q&A, but also share mine. Okay, so curious. Okay, also curiosity. Here we got curious. Okay. Okay. Yes, yeah, so just for the, uh, also for the people maybe watching on on the recording, um, the reason why I'm bringing this again, it it's super important um, to know how am I feeling to then you know give myself what I need or what I don't need. Etc. So this is like a very essential step. And the more vocabulary that we know, it's already known by, by science that the easier we can process that in the brain. Okay. So also something to, to take into account. Also relax, Sophia. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. <laughs> so um so for now I'm just taking a, um um a one minute to something that is uh, an arrival practice. Okay, which is just taking a one minute meditation, right? I, um, 
We have in many, many, many meetings, mm. I think throughout the day. And physically we are in the meeting, but I don't know if any time has happened to you that your mind is somewhere else. Maybe even now your mind is somewhere is thinking, oh, when what am I gonna have for dinner? Or why why didn't I say that in you know in that in the in the previous call? Or I shouldn't I should have sent that email or I shouldn't have sent that email. Okay. So with the purpose of being more present here in the in the meeting, um, I invite you all. Um, to take a comfortable posture, whatever you are. And just for now, really start feeling the feet on the ground. If you're sitting down. And the invitation is either to close your eyes or just to keep them open as you wish. And much of the day, the attention goes outside. And for this minute, the attention will go inside. So starting by taking a deep breath through the nose. And exhaling through the mouth. And as you continue breathing, just taking a moment to check with yourself. How am I feeling? I'm feeling curious, relaxed, sad, anxious, whatever that might be. To just to notice how that might occur in your body. How that might be for you at this moment. And noting that you don't need to change the way you're feeling, the way you're thinking or fixing. It's just simply to observe, simply to notice. Also notice in the mind if it's busy, not busy. And taking the last two deep breaths. And taking the last deep breath through the nose. And exhaling through the mouth as you're opening the eyes, either were close. Feel free to stretch your body if you need, especially after sitting down a long time. It can be oh, yeah. <laughs> it can be useful. Um, so again, just um as we're doing practices, also like I like to to give you the sense of meaning. Uh, like the giving the motionless. Now we go into this. As you can see, we took a, a minute and maybe perhaps, or perhaps not, you notice that your experience changed. Perhaps you're feeling a little bit more relaxed, more grounded, whatever that is for, for you. So to know that already to feel these uh, feelings, for example, it can be more grounded before uh, calling a, an important client. You know, it only took us a minute. I think many times we think that to become more relaxed, we we need to go to the Himalayas for a week. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't think that many times it that could help, of course, but sometimes only taking three breaths a minute can really help us ground if we're going to make an important call, if we're gonna have a, a difficult conversation with a colleague, uh, if we're gonna discuss an important budget. Etc. Etc. Okay, so just to know all these practices. Okay, so a roadmap for today, like I said, getting more familiar with the stress, getting more clarity on what are my responses, and practices, micro practices along the way, like the ones you saw. Okay, so again, turning it to the chat, we're talking about a stress. What comes to mind? So sharing that via the chat or via the Q&A, whatever. What is one word that comes to mind? One image, one emotion? Mm -hmm. no. <laughs> exactly, not, not breathing. Just, yeah, and also, the anxiety, a lot, right? 
And I think what you were sharing now, I think it's, it's quite related when, right, when we're in a, in a position of stress, we'll see it now, the breath becomes very, very shallow and actually the mind gets very, very activated. Okay, so just to lay out the, the context, I, I, I love giving the formal definitions. A stress, what it means is the body's immediate reaction to a perceived threat, a challenge, or a scare. And the reason I'm bringing, well, I'm highlighting here the word of perceived because stress is very related, it's very linked to your own perception. And as you may know, perception is not something universal. So what I what I might perceive as, as a stressful, you might not perceive it. So for example, for me, when I'm entering a, a room full of people, I may perceive it as a stressful and even think, and may even sit with the people that I think might be more safe for me and, and so on. But maybe for other, uh, that might not be a stressful at all. So to know that the element of perception when it comes to stress is very important um, because something that for you is stressful may not be, for example, stressful for your client, for a colleague, for your boss, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Now, qu now qu question. You, you also yeah. have people, and, and I'm one of them certainly, that refers to stress as, well, you know, there can also be positive stress. Is this something like positive stress or is that something that we tell ourselves? So me not getting stressed from, I think stress that comes from someone or somebody, you know, is what your boss imposes on you might be uh, negative stress, right? But if you drive yourself, if you want to train for something like in tennis or if you are working towards a presentation, uh, but I'm thriving, but it's positive stress and I'm rushing from one meeting to another, some might find that accelerating. Mm. Is this something like accelerating stress or is it all negative? Yeah, both. <laughs> There's no, I would say um, it both because it's really like a chemical reaction on your body, right? The release of, of dopamine. And I think it's, it's, it's quite related also to your resources, to your, yeah, to your resources, to also to your emotional state. Maybe at times, you know, something that is thrilling for you and, you know, makes you, okay, want to make that call or want to close a deal, et cetera might not be uh, as exciting all the times mm -hmm. because maybe you can be, for example, lower on your resources. So if, if you can see here my finger, like I think it kind of goes like this, like a bell up and down. Mm -hmm. So the stressors, they pile up and then it gets to a point that I think for, for sports players is very familiar, is the flow, is the performance zone, right? It, it really gets to, to that area where, the challenge that you're facing, whether that be making a call, closing a deal, whatever that is, is very much linking to your resources at the moment and your skills. What is interesting here, that is called the you stress, which is called the good stress. What is happening is that the human body, the nervous system of the human body is made to be on activation and then also is meant to be on relaxation. Okay, so what, what is happening if these stressors are there for a long time is that we can get to a state of exhaustion, fatigue, burnout, mm -hmm. even sickness in many times. So I, I meant good and bad, Dominic, because it's good because it gets you to, to perform, you know, to get out of bed, to go see a friend, go make a call, etc. But when that is persisting over a long time, it, that's where it can get tricky and there's a thin line because maybe we don't have the resources to to be in that position you know for a year for six months mm. etc so it's very also much to you okay and, uh, and at least maybe they can be easy signs at least for me like joy mm -hmm. for example right. if, you, if you used to find joy into something that now is not you know maybe they can be signed that there's also a lot of stress piling up in, into that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Um, I think you might know, and I think it's quite interesting, is stress is quite related to, to survival, right? Also, the mind is constantly looking for ways to, to protect us, to survive, 
because this is the way it's been for thousands of years. Okay, it's a system, the stress system is something that we cannot take out of our brains and not be stressed, you know, any more times in our life because we're high, we're hardwired into this, into, into feeling stress because it's a system that is about minimizing the threats and maximizing the rewards, right? And, and I think we can see this in three different um, levels, the physical, the emotional, and the cognitive. We will see this in a moment. So I thought what would, would be very interesting, we're talking about stress being very related to perception. Uh, so related to your own job, what are one or two things that you perceive as threats, as challenges, or as scares? And there's no, no right or wrong in this question. It's just a, a question to, to introspect, to get to know yourself. And also what, what could be the... Um, what could be uh, stressful for others? Mm -hmm. And happy, yeah. That can be maybe writing the form of an email or a comment, mm -hmm. a review, a call. There can be many, many, many different ways. So also for the people there, um, um, yeah, watching it, like asking yourself, um, because this is very useful data as you keep mastering your emotional intelligence, what is stressful to me? Like I know, for example, for me now, uh, giving this talk, it could be stressful if I am perceived as, you know, incompetent or as if I'm not doing my, my job professionally, or if I, if I'm perceiving in my own telenovela here, in my narrative, <laughs> that I'm not helpful, that sometimes for me can be stressful, okay? But it's, it's very much on my perception. It's, it doesn't have to do many times with you, the audience, or the environment. Mm -hmm. So very important to know as you as you perceive, as, yeah, as you're going through your day, okay, what am I perceiving as, mm -hmm. as stressful? Okay, um, and very interesting here, we're, as I was saying here, we're looking at different levels. Uh, and when we're stressed, we tend to go to very specific cognitive patterns and very specific behavior patterns. So for example, uh, I know myself when I'm stressed, um, I'm thinking to myself, well, I'm never going to get hired again. You know, I'm such a failure. No one is going to hire me again. I'm, you know, I'm so bad at this. And I can be very much into catastrophizing. Um, I know this maybe is not real, but it can be an automatic response of mine. And for example, my behavior can be um, sending more emails to clients, maybe when, they, when there's no more room to send emails. I don't know. Mm -hmm also making it up in a way, but in a way it's also very, very real. So the invitation here is that taking a look at this image, you see 12 different, what is called cognitive distortions. Okay. And this is like I was saying before, this is very related to our own perception. And especially the, when we're stressed, we perceive reality in, in a very distorted way in a very incomplete way, okay? So taking a look, right? We have mind reading. Um, <laughs> that can be this one. I, I do this one a lot, right? That when you think that others are feeling negative, negative focus is about negativity bias, um, right? For example, if you see my screen and for example here, I get a feedback from, after this session, I get a feedback from six people that I did pretty good. And then I, I get some feedback from one person that it was okay. And then my whole narrative becomes a one, oh, I did it okay. Oh my gosh, I could have done better. Oh my gosh, I could have done better. Oh my gosh. And you see, I don't see anything else. I become very, very centered on this one thought. So this is negativity bias. And this is something again, hardwired into, into all of us. 
related again to catastrophizing. Like I said before, oh my God, I'm not gonna get higher again ever in my life. Um, and we have different ones labeling, should thinking. So just taking a look at this and for your own reflection and feel free to also to share with uh, would there be one or two that you relate to the most whenever you're stressed? And if so, in which ways? So just giving you some, some moments to, to reflect. And I can, while we do that, I can share mine. I, I was expecting one to see, to see one on there, Nicole, which is like kind of lashing out to others. Just, I'm, I'm not seeing that, you know, I think if I saw reading these, reviewing those, uh, I don't really see myself in any of them as a pattern, like any, if any emotional reasoning, maybe mm. I feel that way. So it's got to be that way. Um, but when I'm really stressed, I tend to like lash out, like to the people close to me, like not in a bad, bad way, but just being uh, short lipped or small lipped and, and just, uh, mm. Um, not being as polite as I would usually be and um, kind of pulling back, right? Because I, I need to handle that situation now and I need to relieve that stress somewhere. Mm. Um, that, that would be me. Yeah. And that, that that's super interesting. Um, well, here, Dominica was saying, it's only about what goes on here in the mind. And I think okay. kind of what you were sharing is more behavior related which is super linked and I think it's, it's very useful also for, for what is coming next up. Uh, many of us, um, and thank you, Sophia, the, the control fallacy, right? Also, I, I relate to that one. So also, Dominic, super interesting also to link it to a very important point that whenever we're feeling stress, we can go into, I think you, you might have heard of the fight, flight, or freeze mode, which are three very automatic responses related to, to, to your own behavior. Um, that it can be about, if I'm stressed, I'm going to fighting mode. So for example, into, yeah, like you were saying, lashing out or, mm. or going against someone, or if I feel attacked, you know, I, I give it double to you. I can go into flight mode, right? That is much about running away, right? If I feel stress, I'm not going back ever to that place or I'm not talking back to that client ever again. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm getting, let's say, fired from a company and that became very stressful for me, I'm not talking about that company anymore. Mm -hmm. That can be a, a flight response. And then we have freeze, right? which I think is very self-explanatory. When we feel helpless, when we feel like in the moment, oh my God, what yeah. am I, what am I yeah. doing? So just again, I'm giving all this um, information just for you to see, oh, where do I need to see myself and also in which situations? Because you might see yourself in fight, flight, or freeze, F3, in different situations, and, and that could also be normal. But I think it's very, very useful already to know, to identify, mm -hmm. so then you can change it, right? If we don't know, it, it, it's impossible to, to, change, to change something. Okay, so just wanted to explain one of the 12 that is called the, about negativity bias, right? Like for example, like I said before, I'm coming after the session and, and then Dominic is telling me, okay, you know, there are five people with great feedback and one person with okay feedback, and then I become fixated on this one person. And this is something that is called negativity bias. Doesn't mean that I don't want to improve, get better. That's something different but mm -hmm. I don't get fixated mm -hmm. on it. And how can I identify this, this negativity by it? It's very much about when I'm very, when it's very hard for me to focus, right? when the attention is going many places, when I'm ruminating, ruminating, it, it comes, I don't know if you know, from cows. Cows, they chew. Mm -hmm. um, what is it? They chew then they try to digest and they vomit the grass. Exactly. And then they chew again. And exactly. it's like, so humans, we do the same with thoughts. Yeah. Oh, wow. I'm shit at this. Yep. And then I spit it out. Yep. And then 
and then it comes this process over and over and then over. <laughs> exactly and then that can go into catastrophic that that becomes like i was saying before my my entire picture and what i think is very interesting is that i tend to underestimate our my resources when i'm in this i think i'm less capable than what i am actually capable so this is mm -hmm. something to to know when this is happening also to know okay this is not the complete picture there's something mm -hmm. to, to be aware which for me kind of relates like i was saying to, yeah, mm -hmm. to this picture okay 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 so for the next one the invitation is to color a, a body silhouette if you have pen and paper hopefully close or, or nearby. Okay. And hopefully if you've already um, drawn it, it's not a drawing context um <laughs> but to to pinpoint whenever you're stressed to color or to put a, a point where in your body do you feel the stress is it more your shoulders your jaw eyes chest hips legs so just in your own body silhouette this is for you this is not too sure just to pinpoint Okay, wow. Like I know, for example, for me, the chest is very heavy. So maybe I, I color my chest more intensely. So just taking a few moments for that. And even sometimes you, you can go even a little mm -hmm. bit deeper. And for example, with the, the, the part of the body that you color, that you identify, also to kind of to name, how is that sensation? Is that something more constrictive? Is it tension? Is it, uh, like you were saying in the beginning, it's like, like shallow, a, a shallow sensation, like pulsing also, but not maybe for now, but for also for later. Again, with intention that the more we know, the more identify, uh, the easier and the faster we know, okay, you know, mm -hmm. I'm feeling this stress. It's okay. I'm breathing. I know what is coming. I know my mind, my mind can go into these games of these distortions or this negativity bias or these impulses of lashing out or, but hey, I'm, I'm here. Okay. So, so now we go to the, oh, here. So now we go to the next uh, section of developing clarity. Developing clarity on, on the stress. So, and it's very, I think, uh, interesting for me to, to see this concept, like a shift um, that much of our time we're acting based on something that is called our autopilot our habits, our patterns, um, etc. For example, something interesting to, to share is that we have 90,000 to 120,000 thoughts per day and what, less than 1% of all of those thoughts are new. That mm. means that 99% is, is already the telenovela that I, that I already yeah. know. So this is something to, and I think it really reflects autopilot um, to, okay, how can I stay present? And again, how can I shift out of my always, especially if my always don't serve me? Mm -hmm. Maybe um, 
being on my social media before an important call maybe used to help me to kind of to ground me but maybe now it makes me even more nervous so it's again this question of what are my autopilot habits or, and patterns are no longer serving me because mm -hmm. we it's like kind of like this device here like we we update it every once in a while so it's the same here we have this uh, software from <laughs> years ago so it's, it's very useful to every now and then to give it a, an update also about when we're in conversations or the way we relate to colleagues or also to ourselves okay so for this and for the I'll say for the rest of the session we're working on this practice that is called a stop that I think is, is super simple and it has four steps, like the ones you see now, right? And, and this is the invitation. Whenever there's uncertainty, whenever there's um, change, stress, etc., the most helpful way to change from autopilot to aware is to already to stop. Okay, this first to, to stop and taking a breath because many of the times we're going into a reaction. I can, sorry, Dom, I'm, I'm taking your example, but it's, it's good. It's, yeah, it's like, great. I, you know, like I'm not seeing now because it's like my, my old way is what I know is what is familiar, right? And each of us, we, we tend to act in certain ways. All of us do that are familiar for us. Mm -hmm. So the first thing and the most important is again, stopping and like I'm doing here, like, okay, taking a breath. Okay, and this is already very important. Um, also relating to the question at the beginning, like when is it good stress and bad stress? Um, I was saying the body is, um, the nervous system, it has two functions, one to activate and one to relax. Okay, and when we're stressed, I think as you may figure, mm. we're very activated, okay? So what is useful is to engage the other part, to mm. bring the relaxation part. And for this, I'll, I'll bring a, it's, and it's the only slide that is related to neuroscience, so don't, <laughs> don't, don't panic <laughs> if you see that. Um, so it's kind of the way the brain works when we're in a stress, right? You can see the red part of the brain that is called the limbic system. That is the part of the brain that is in charge of turning on the alarm button mm -hmm. when the brain is perceiving a threat. And then we have the blue one, the prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that is our own CEO. It's the part of the brain that is related to logic, uh, to reasoning, to rationality, mm -hmm. etc. cetera. Um, but what I find interesting here and for the purpose is that whenever we're stressed, the first part of the brain that is activated is the alarm system. So this is what I mean, we are reacting, okay? And the, the most useful way to build a bridge between the alarm system and the, and the prefrontal cortex is to breathe. If I'm not breathing, I'm going into autopilot because my brain is only thinking about surviving. If I'm breathing, I'm able to engage my prefrontal cortex. So for example, is a part of the brain that if I'm about to make a, a phone, an important phone call, is saying, oh wow, should I take a, a few moments here? Should I take 30 seconds for myself to, to walk, get some water, to get some fresh air before making the call? Okay, maybe, maybe I should do that. I think maybe because I'm feeling a little bit agitated or stressed, etc. So it's the part of the brain that is choosing uh, for you and that has that rationale. So it's very important. Again, um, breathing is not about like a hippie thing. <laughs> it really comes from neuroscience. It, it, has, a, it has a biological. Mm. So like a, if, if we apply it to the context of sales or, or extreme um athletics or sports okay like tennis so let's say what do you tell players or, or professionals like let, let's stick to tennis you're 
in the final set uh, tie break and you're you're a couple of points down and you think oh, I'm never gonna catch that person again you know I'm I'm not gonna win or in in sales maybe somebody new to sales having to do cold calling of people and that just completely uh, makes them feel anxious um what do you tell them in that context is it to stop to take your breather to recalibrate themselves or what what is mm -hmm. something that you can actively do in that situation yeah exactly i would say yeah to self-regulate i think this is the most important word for example when we're feeling activated Oh shoot! I'm feeling anxious. Like I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna succeed in this call. I'm not gonna sign a client. Oh my god! Oh my god! And when we notice already that we're in this, there can be many ways. Whatever is helpful for each of us. I know mm -hmm. for myself, is breathing. I know, for example, is to to take a walk. I know sometimes for myself is also to, um, to say that out loud. Oh wow! I'm thinking I'm shit. And to question what I'm thinking. Yeah. Is that is that really true? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, no, or I'm thinking, oh wow, I'm, I'm not gonna sign that client. Do I know that for hundred percent sure? Yeah. I, actually, okay. I, I don't know. It's so also to to question and, and to see there are many, many different ways. Mm -hmm. But this is the the important thing of not going to the old ways, especially if they're not helpful. To kind of to question, I think we we have a voice in the mind, um, but actually we have other voices. So to bring mm -hmm. the, the other voices, to bring kind of the the voice that is more of an advocate also for mm -hmm. for yourself, not the only Great. one that is. Yeah. Apparent. Great. Okay. And very interesting also whenever we're stressed, um, taking this this step of observing, noticing how we are and i think this is this is quite interesting because um they did a study uh in finland and they they drew empty body silhouettes like the ones you did before with the name of the emotion on top and participants were provoked into different emotions through movies through pictures etc and what i th think is, is super relevant is that most of us is not something black or white, but tend to feel the emotions in, in similar par parts of our body. Okay, so this is this can be also for for this context for, for sales, it can be very related because, for example, if I'm feeling anxiety, I know that my, my sensations can be repetitive. Oh wow, I, I noticed that I'm biting my teeth. I'm wow, very strong here. I'm I'm noticing that. I'm clenching here, my, my fist. So mm -hmm. this over time, it becomes repetitive um, because the body is, it, it speaks its own language. It's very automatic. So, but the more the mind is aware of it, the, again, the more skillful I can process here. Okay. And as we're going towards the finish, I wanted to go, um, and show this video of observing how am I in uh, moments of stress. Location, location, location. Brought to you by the Conscious Leadership Group. Find them on the web at www.conscious.is. Animation by Graham Franks, www.grahamfranks.com. One question that conscious leaders ask themselves over and over is, where am I? To support leaders in locating themselves as they ask the question, where am I? We offer this tool, a line, a simple black line. At any moment, all leaders and all people are either above the line or below the line. Our location describes how we're being with what is occurring in our life right now. If we're above the line, we are open, curious, and committed to learning. If we are below the line, we are closed, defensive, and committed to being right. Stop right now and simply ask yourself, where am I? In this now moment, am I above the line or below the line? Typically, when people are below the line, they believe certain things about the world. For example, they believe there is not enough. It could be that there's not enough money or time or space or energy or love. 
People below the line also believe that their story about the situation is right. People below the line also believe that there is a threat out there. Something or someone is threatening their desire for approval, control, or security. And people below the line see the situation as serious. The deeper below the line they are, the more serious things look. People below the line tend to behave certain ways as well. They tend to cling to an opinion, find fault and blame, gossip, explain, rationalize and justify, get overwhelmed, and avoid conflict or pursue conflict for the sake of winning. When people are above the line, they believe that learning and growing are more important than being right. They believe that all people and circumstances are their allies, here for their growth. They believe that from a distance, almost everything is funny. People above the line live in curiosity, listen deeply, speak unarguably, question all their beliefs, and live a life of play. Now, knowing what you know about being above or below the line, where are you? One thing to know as you consider this question, we are hardwired to go below the line. Literally, our brain is programmed to perceive threat, and when it does, a chemical cocktail pierces through our veins, and we go below the line. This reaction was designed to help us survive in the presence of a real threat to our physical survival. An issue for modern day leaders is that often our brains can't tell the difference between a threat to our physical survival and a threat to our ego or identity. We react and get defensive when we experience a threat to our ego. So in many ways, being below the line is natural and normal. But when we are below the line, we're not in a state, literally brain state, of high creativity, collaboration, innovation, and relational connection. We're simply trying to survive. Leaders today can't fly if they're in survival mode. So the first activity of conscious leadership is location, location, location. In this now moment, where am I? Telling ourselves and others the truth about our current location <laughs> begins the great conversation. Okay. So I thought it would be interesting to bring this tool of, of the line, which is so simple. Again, not to punish ourselves. Oh, I'm here, I'm there. But again, to notice, am I very yeah, defensive at the moment? Am I curious? Am I open? Am I open about, for example, am I curious about uh, making the, you know, making this call and learning for the sake of the my my process? Uh, on my sales skills and my very defensive like oh wow I need to make this call if I don't make this call uh, I'm bad I'm up so again to notice and like it like it's here on this location location oh, like is this here on the micro practice right whenever uh your stress the invitation is to go to stop in taking a breath and noticing, where am I? Mm -hmm. Am I in a place of curiosity? Am I in a place of really threatened? Do I feel threatened? Not again uh, to punish ourselves, but just to know, to have like a really um, honest conversation with ourselves. Okay. Um, and just I wanted to close it by giving this um last step of proceeding and i think when it comes to proceeding this is something that could be super super useful um that i got this also because it's something that i teach is called non-violent communication and in non-violent communication this is a framework to have conversations especially difficult conversation but for the sake of this call we're just taking a look at something that is called the needs the human needs and the concept of this is that Whenever, of course, the needs of shelter, food, um, these very more like primary needs are satisfied, uh, it comes to say that we all have human needs. Okay, so I think it's super interesting here um, to perhaps only taking a look at the title of the different human needs that we can have. For example, connection. It can be meaning play, honesty, freedom, harmony, physical well-being. 
etc. And also the invitation is to really bring it to, to your day-to-day -day life. For example, I was thinking really to your, to your own sales call in the way of how can you identify what can be a need of yours when you're making, for example, an important call and what can be, I think, more importantly, the needs of your clients. Because I think this is very already important work because if the needs are satisfied, this is when it comes to happiness and growing and really a lot of satisfaction. When there are the unpleasant emotions that we saw at the beginning, like frustration, uh, disappointed, anxiety, this, what is saying to us is that the needs are not met, are not satisfied. So here, my last um, invitation in the last practice is that thinking of a difficult situation at work that you're experiencing or could be a challenge in a scale from one to 10, choosing a five. So it's something not too activating or not uh, too, uh, too mild. And also to think for yourself, what could be your underlying need in this challenging situation? And what could be the underlying need of the other person in this situation? Just for this, I give you a few moments to perhaps identify one need, or it can be multiple. Okay, I'm bringing that to an end. As I wanted to bring it here. And also opening it for, for any questions, anything that I can answer, happy to, or any yeah. answer. Mm -hmm. So like one, one thing that will keep coming from, from people watching is, all right, with all that great now, now I know, when I feel a certain way, why I might feel a certain way, the biases I fall into, the natural patterns and behaviors, when I'm under stress and I'm observing myself, but man, that doesn't stop me being stressed. Is, you know, is that maybe too much to expect, right? That you cannot stop being stressed. I mean, especially when you're in a situation where you feel constant stress, that might be for different reasons, right? Uh, the job is not for you, the people you work with are not for you, whatever. But is there something that you can do to manage the situation better or that when you fall into the negativity bias or that you feel I'm not enough, I can't do this, you know, I'm shit, that's what you said. Is there anything to overcome or that you tell people that they can work on? Hmm. So the, the first one, it's, um, in my opinion, it's a, it's a challenging question because like you said, it has many different components. Like one of you that you said, and, and I think for me, super important is also the system that we're on is very important. So maybe like you were saying, maybe the company I'm at or the structure under I am working uh, for, maybe it's already super stressful. So maybe, you know, I can be here Dalai Lama, but if the system I am in, it's very sure. to toxic and, and it's yeah. nothing we can do. And I would never advise that to anyone. I would never, I mean, also, yeah, like an important note, we can really uh, grow a lot into these mm -hmm. skills for ourselves. But I think also the system is something that is so, so big. Mm -hmm. So um, that's also something to take into consideration. Also the group I'm on, the team I'm on, the boss, uh, the environment, et cetera, because also that's, something super important when it comes to stress. So that, that would be one thing mm -hmm. to also to notice is the stress, is the environment where, where I'm on supportive? Is yep. it making my stress, wow, 10 times worse? Or what is it like? Um, and the other one could be that stress uh, in itself. And I always, when I talk about emotion, emotional intelligence, is that there's a lot of data in what we're feeling. So for example, stress 
in today's society, we say, oh, I'm, I'm stressed. Stress can have many different sources. Maybe it is that I'm disappointed. Maybe it is that I'm overwhelmed. Maybe it is that I'm frustrated. Okay, so also perhaps identifying which of the sources, if I, if I can, uh, because that can give me, I would say, a lot of important data. Like you were saying, Dom, maybe I'm, I'm super stressed because the, the projects I'm getting are very, uh, are not challenging at all or not, not allowing me to grow in the way I want to or to interact with people if I'm a very social person. Mm -hmm. So also to, to really see that as, okay, what could be going on here in my life, in my projects? Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, something that I consider useful is also when it comes to stress to divide, to put a list of what gives, gives me energy and what drains my energy. Mm -hmm. If let's say I do a list of all the th things I did on my day, and most of, the, most of them are energy training, that means that there's something going on there. If mm -hmm. most of my day's tasks are about energy training, that could be, that could be one thing. Because the, you know what I mean specifically, I think that, that it's not only specific to sales, but it happens here most often, especially to people that are more junior in their career. You know, when they're very heavy on reaching out to people uh, they're usually measured on goals on a weekly, on a monthly basis. And then when you're new to that career and you have to, especially in sales and, and software sales, that is very high paced. Uh, you maybe have activity targets that you need to reach out to X amount of customers. You need to book meetings in a day for your colleagues. And if you you fail to hit that in a day, in a month, or you go home and you've heard no for 80 times, it's sometimes challenging for these people to motivate themselves coming back, but some do. Some get the motivation out of the two or three or four years and just take the others as a way to get to the next years, right? But for some, mm. it's difficult. For some, it's possible. But some fall into that hole and cannot get out. Is there anything that you you can give him as a nugget to practice that when at the end of the day, you've heard no for 50 times and you feel devastated? to not take it into the night or to just replenish overnight? Or is there anything that you can recommend as a practice? Hmm. I would say um, yeah, two simple things. Uh, the first one that really, um, what you say, like an outcome is not related to your own identity mm -hmm. as a professional and I would say as a human. So for example, listening no 80 times doesn't mean that you're not a good no. person or that you don't deserve to be loved by your partner, by your family, which I think, or respected by your team, which for me, it's important to put something in between. And then um, also like, like getting the, the line video that I was showing also to stay curious. Okay. What, what could I learn from, mm -hmm. from this situation? Like, um, what if I ask for feedback to, to the people around me? What from people I trust, what could they recommend me? Mm -hmm. Also like staying, how would I say, like staying curious and at the same time, not punishing ourselves that, that much, which I think is we can be doing, especially when we go into the negativity bias. Also to, to put that, um, yeah, that space, that barrier, um, and also at the same time, especially for us people that are young, or even if you're old, all of, I would say most of these skills are, are trainable. Yeah. Okay, what could it be doing this uh, different tomorrow? What, what if I learn from this person? What if I shadow from this one that is very inspiring? So I would say to, to see that and also to, when you're doing that, to also to see how you feel, to take all this, all this data and to, to then ap apply it. Great. Perfect. Now, because I'm looking at the, uh, at the time, we're almost at the hour mark. Mm -hmm. um, if people want to know more or just follow up with you as they're connected, where mm -hmm. can we find you best? As I was uh, writing here, uh, LinkedIn, Nakor Elliot, Instagram, Nakor Elliot. Um, Perfect. 
feel free to write me also nakorelliot.gmail.com and my website. So to write me on, on any of those words. Perfect. So to anyone, please feel free to follow up with Nakor on, on that or any related issues. Again, um, thanks a lot for, for sharing your wisdom on that. And I think that's a topic that most of us don't think about on a daily basis, you know, but I think it's very, very important. And my insight was to that it all starts with reflection and listening to yourself and seeing where it might come from and taking a breather. And uh, that's what one of, one of my mentors taught me, you know, Dominic, breathe. You know, sometimes in situations, just breathe. We forget to breathe and uh, come back to your base. And what is it that you're feeling? Why are you feeling this? And um, that that emotions can be not always, cannot be under press, but can be, can be controlled or can be funneled in two mm. directions, right? We're not just a play ball of our emotions. So thanks a lot also for sharing what we can do about it. Uh, and also Domin the... Dominic yeah. on that, just to, to close it, sorry, because <laughs> you said something very important. I think comparison is a double-edged sword, hmm. especially I would say on, on sales too, like it can really help me to get inspiration, but it can really be a, a measure, a source for self-judgment yeah. and punishing myself. So also noticing how am I using comparison, which can be something very um very useful that we all do we will always do it but to reflect am i using yep. comparison in a way that is helpful for me perfect so thanks a lot really for taking the time out of, out of your busy schedule and on a wednesday evening really enjoy talking to you thanks for all of you who tuned in uh stay in contact with us with high rise follow up with me or us and have a beautiful rest of your night and a great rest of your week talk to you soon mm -hmm.